Hi there, come on in and make sure you don't touch that dial. I'm Fred Trost bringing you a brand new show here on public television. It's called Outdoor Digest. We deal in fishing and hunting in the shooting sports and wildlife. For today's show, we're going to talk about walleye fishing. Oh, we'll catch some big ones, but as usual, we bring them back and cook them up. A great recipe for cidered walleye will tell you how to make it. We have a feature on beaver, one of nature's most interesting creatures, outdoor news, and a lot more. So make sure you stay tuned. The premiere show, I'm Fred Trost, and it's called The Outdoor Digest. We like to see sunny skies, maybe a few clouds when we go fishing, but that's only for our own comfort. Fish generally prefer cloudy skies, and some, like walleye and catfish, prefer night. That's why O.J. Cipherline finds walleye are easier to catch in murky water. day like today, where they weren't hitting all that well, how did you decide to go where we went? Well, I took a gamble on, on big fish and then numbers. Uh, the big fish do hang down below the islands, down along south of the little island. But uh, today it was just, I wanted a big fish for you, which we ended up getting. Uh, the water clarity, because we've had north winds for the last six days in a row, started to clear up where you could actually visually with your eyes see the reefs. And of course, this the walleyes, you know, we chased them right out of there. So they went for deeper water. That's one of the reasons we went up to 30, 40 feet where we were. We've often found that the muddier the water, the more shallow you'll find walleye, and you'll find them feeding during the day. Walleye have very sensitive eyes, and when the water is clear, like in Canadian lakes, you'll almost always find walleye in the deepest water on the bottom. The water is usually muddy in rivers that flow into large lakes, and these waters close to port can produce good catches, especially at night when the boat traffic slows down. The wind kicked up in the afternoon, not necessarily dangerous for a small boat, but in rough chop, a larger boat will get you to and from fishing a little faster. The first lure that O.J. put out wasn't tuned right. It just wouldn't stay down. Well, what happens is that turned up on its side. The fish just knows that a bait fish does not swim on its side. If you put a little pressure on that, like you're going to turn to the outside, if this was the outside lure, and it speeded up a little bit, look what happened. Whoops, right out of the water it comes. It'll do the same thing. So what you do with them, it has nothing to do with this red bill. This bill here happens to be red. It's this wire harness hookup here that I'm rubbing my finger upside down. You take that, now this lure was running through the water tipped up this way, tipped up this way. You want to bend this very slightly in the opposite direction. Just put a little pressure on it. Now, this being a super magnum, you got to put a little more pressure on this one than you do on the little ones. So if I got enough pressure on that, now see how that's okay. I'll bring it back up to the surface. See how when I pull the rod forward, it's diving right out of sight. It's now no longer riding up on its side. Hot and tots. Are they the only bait you can catch walleyes on out here? No, but by far they are the most productive. Uh, the bass magnet, uh, Bill Westmoreland's bass magnet works real well. Um, Erie Deeries, nightcrawler harnesses, drifting leeches, it all works. Uh, the reason I stick mostly to hot and tots mainly is because I can cover more territory. These fish do move, they roam a lot up and down the reefs looking for crabs, looking for sand shiners, looking for alewives. Uh, gizzard shad. So they do move a lot and I can stay on top of them. I can usually tell from my experience out there which way they're moving and I can usually head them off when the main pack of people lose the fish. I'm usually where the fish are heading for. It's just through a lot of experience. What, how do you decide colors? Uh, you've got ver every, every shade of hot and tight a lot of diving, big diving baits uh, on here, but uh, how do you decide what color you're going to use? Well, colors is, means a lot to a walleye. This year it's been a lot of the lime green and silver. Uh, the reason I have, I've got every color that they make. I don't want somebody calling me on the radio and saying, 
OJ or Rich. Uh, black with white polka dots is a real hot color today, and my customers look at me and say, why don't you have any? That's the main reason I have so many colors. Bright day, bright bait, dark day, dark bait works real well for walleyes. What they're feeding on, I'm mostly out there, it's crabs, alewives, uh, sand shiners, so it's silver, silver gray, silver green, uh, crab imitation. On a cloudy day? On a cloudy day, crab color, your golden black, which is also represents crab. Uh, just about any dark color will produce fish. Another little secret and trick is go to the weirdest thing you've got in your box as far as colors because the fish seem to get orientated to seeing the same thing all the time and they will lash out at something they don't know what it is. That's worked for me quite a few times. What's the weirdest lure you've ever caught a fish in? Well, it's colors. I mean, I'm not talking particular lure. It's yeah. colors. Uh, it would be that rainbow hot and tot. It's got like five different colors. It looks like a rainbow. And then again, there's one they call a tiger stripe. It's got an orange belly, yellow with black stripes on the side. It's, it's, it's a weird looking one. But they have produced fish. Hold on. Hold on. A nice walleye coming aboard for Tim Farragut. Right, Tim, all right. <laughs> yeah, good four or five finder. Not too many years ago, you had to go to Canada to catch walleye like this. But thanks to fisheries management and walleye clubs that help maintain walleye rearing ponds, lots of states are catching more and bigger walleye each year. Five pounds plus isn't unusual. There are a lot of ways to catch them, but this one was caught trolling a deep-running crankbait. Oh, this is a nice walleye, John. There's 10 pounds of fish, John, guys. There's a master angler right there. Whoa, this is it, baby. All right, whoa. It's a funny thing about walleye. The best eating ones are the smaller ones, 15 to 20 inches. Okay. And most anglers fish for walleye because they're so good to eat. But when a really big one hits, even though it might not taste nearly as good, fishermen go bonkers over it. Oh, it was a nice walleye. Ended up weighing somewhere over eight pounds. Bob Garner's biggest yet and a real thrill. A lot of people don't realize that there are more big walleye where they fish than they think. This one inhaled the lure, but it could have been just as happy with a crawler harness or a jig and minnow. The secret? Being at the right place at the right time. The oldest story of all in the world of fishing. A lot of people want to know, where did we tape that feature? Well, I tell you what, on this show, we're not going to point out where we do these things. That's not the point, because wherever you live around the country and you have walleye fishing, remember, walleye are very light sensitive. They either go deep, they like murky water, or you can catch them at night. Remember that when you're walleye fishing. Also, very important to tune your lures. Make sure they're swimming the way you want them to swim. If you do catch a big walleye, a big fish, maybe you could find your picture in our trophy book. Walt Perwalny caught this 10 and 3 quarter pound sheep's head or freshwater drum trolling a nightcrawler harness. Here's a big perch, a 1 and 3 quarter pound perch. Pat Verberg caught it by using a single hook and nightcrawler. And casting a little Cleo is how Edna Martin hooked onto this trophy three pound, nine ounce pink salmon. And John Sparkman was fishing with spawn, probably for steelhead, when he caught this 11 and three quarter pound walleye. Here's a 20 pound gobbler that Steve Ferguson called up, a real trophy with an 11 inch beard. And Glenn Rogers took this 10 pointer in kind of an unusual way. He did it by, get this, wrapping it in. Was wrapping them together. I didn't have no antlers to wrap. Now hold it. This is my scent. your buck lure scent. So you said you used this in, instead of rattling? Here, yeah. show me what you did with the microphone. Uh, the one I was using, I busted. I'd wrap them. And Broke them. Like but <laughs> I brought a rat seven point in, and I couldn't get a shot at him. And then. It was the second day in the afternoon. My uncle, he sat in his blind, and I went moving around and found a spot, and I sat down and I wrapped them, and then two does come in, and they looked at me a little bit, and they 
bound it off, and then he come in behind him and. So you call that wrapping them in. <laughs> Instead of rattling, you get a couple of pieces of plastic containers and clang them together. That's called wrapping a buck in. Well, I'm getting horns this year. Now, I don't know why he needs the antlers. Heck, he did just fine on his own. But let's wrap up this trophy book by making Glenn Rogers our trophy buck hunter of the week. My old hunting buddy Bob Canope and I were hunting rabbits one day when he turned to me and said, you know, Garner, he says, I can't believe you own beagles. And I asked him what he meant by that, and he said, well, you don't do anything they say. They don't come when you call them. They don't fetch anything, and they don't point anything. They don't really cover a lot of ground. They're kind of slow and pokey, and they never pay attention. He said, don't get me wrong, I love them, but I can't believe you're patient enough to own one. Well, I told him, hey, wait a minute. When your bird dog doesn't come when it's called, what do you do? You get mad. And if it doesn't fetch something it's supposed to, you're really upset. But not me. If my beagle doesn't fetch a rabbit, well, that's okay. I didn't expect him to anyway. If he doesn't run a deer during the day, hey, I'm pleased. And if he gives a rabbit a good run, I'm really ecstatic. And when my beagle comes when I call him, it's cause for a celebration. They don't work fast, that's true, but they're thorough. They climb in all the brush piles, and you wouldn't do that. So I told my old buddy Bob, I said, Bob, I can't see why everybody doesn't own a beagle. As far as I'm concerned, the good Lord did his best work when he created beagle puppies. <laughs> why do big game animals, deer and elk, often bed down below the crest of a windswept ridge? Well, the wind blows over the crest and down to the bedded animal, giving it warning of a predator approaching from over the hill. From its bed, it watches for predators that try to approach from below. Oftentimes in this segment of the show, we'll have something to do with oh, hunting or fishing or the shooting sports, but every now and then we take a look at some of our wildlife friends. This week, the subject is beavers. Water trickling through a beaver dam, a familiar sound in the north where beavers build dams to flood streams so the water will back up into the aspen, their favorite food. Beaver also flood roads, causing millions of dollars worth of damage each year, which makes them very unpopular with county road commissions in the north country. Damien Lunning from Mayo removes a lot of nuisance beaver, and he thinks they're nature's most interesting creature. Well, he's built up a, a couple feet here, maybe two feet of the dam. Yeah, right here it is. Uh, down for there, I would say it's about four foot. Hmm. Now, what's our strategy? Where are we going to be up? You can see the house right there. That's where he and his wife lives. Is yeah, that the? Yeah, that's where they're sleeping right now, I guess. Well, what we're going to do is just go up by it, and what we need is a wind in our favor to blow the lure across the pond so once he comes out, he gets a whiff of it, and then he'll come over to us. So our beaver that we want to film yet in daylight is sleeping. I would say he's in there sleeping, yes. Does he hear us, you suppose? I, you know, we've made quite a bit of noise. I'm sure he knows something's out here, but... And you say you can pull his chain here to get him... Yeah, hopefully... Ring I, his doorbell? Hopefully I can get him to come out. I got a pretty good-sized rock in my pocket here, and... I picture out in a pond that sounds like another beaver slapping its tail. Oh. And usually that rousts them out fairly fast. Get the scent out here, Damien. This is from the castor gland, you say, of a beaver. Right. Uh, the bigger chunks is uh, what's on the side of the gland, and then and there's a watery type of liquid in there too. And this would come off of or the back leg or something of the beaver? Right, right at the vent. Oh, or around underneath the tail. Right. And then he, how does the beaver normally, uh, if it was going to mark his territory, how would he deposit that? Okay, what they do is uh, they'll grab some mud, bring it up on the bank, turn around and just squirt some of this castor out on the hmm. mud. So they actually, they don't just leave it as they go, they... No, they squirt it, you know, at will. So we're going to put this in the air, and after the slap on the water and the scent in the air. Right. You know, as soon as the beaver comes out, we dab that stick in there, and, uh, you know, he should be lying over here. Hmm. Well, this will be interesting. Aren't beavers concerned about our scent? Normally they're not. Uh, 
they say they're at home in the water and they, they don't feel threatened in the water. So, uh, you know, we shouldn't have any problem with human odor. So we're going to put this castor oil that's the scent of another beaver out here and then antagonize this beaver. Will the one that, that comes up, will that be the male or the female, or do you know? We won't be able to tell, but it will probably be the male. They're the ones that are usually more aggressive. The female's pregnant right now, and more than likely we're not going to even see her. Not only didn't we see the female, but we never saw the male. Evidently, they heard us talking and moving around and decided to stay inside their lodge. Another night, on another pond, we set up again more quietly and soon saw the bubbles of a beaver family coming out to investigate. I held the stick with the oil from a beaver's castor gland, letting the wind carry it over the pond, and right away a beaver moved in. You can see it in the water in the upper left of the frame. It decides not to come any closer. It doesn't see another beaver, but the castorium, as it's called, definitely has its interest. So he'll come up, how close will he get to us? Well, we've had him within six inches of the Six hand. inches? Yeah. And does it want to fight or what? Not really. You know, it knows that we're not another beaver, and it just looks at you and blows air out through its nose, uh, and then it'll slap its tail and swim out in the pond and do that a couple times. Put on a little performance. Really. I think more or less trying to get us out of here. There were three beaver from this family cruising in front of me, taking turns coming in close to check out that strange castorium. It's a scent that not only attracts beavers, but it attracts all kinds of animals. It's still used as a base for expensive perfumes because it holds the fragrances of substances it's exposed to, slowly releases these fragrances when warmed by human body heat. Now this beaver glides quietly through the many tunnels and gullies they create all over the pond, most useful to them in the winter when the surface water is frozen. I remain as still as I can holding the stick in front of me, seeing if that beaver won't swim within a few feet. His eyes aren't very good, but I think he doesn't like coming so close in shallow water. The sun has already sunk over the horizon in the west, and. While the beaver were out in deeper water, I took the opportunity to move to a log that was closer to that open water, and it seemed to work. This fellow was really sniffing the air with his nose, and he gave me a quick look at his teeth. Now, in slow motion, we can really see them well. Two long incisors on top, two on the bottom. That orange enamel on the front is very hard. The back of the teeth are soft so the backs wear down faster, making them sharp on the front like chisels. It's easy for them to chew a six inch aspen in half in 10 minutes, a five inch willow in about three. The world record, if there is one, was 37 inches in diameter, a 110 foot tall cottonwood tree that was felled by beavers in British Columbia. Now these beavers won't start to work on their trees until after dark, I imagine they'll be on the lookout for that strange beaver that they swore they smelled by the edge of the pond just before sundown. But they did their best to scare it away. That's a famous beaver behavior, the way a beaver signals alarm to other beavers. I agree with Damien Lunning, the beaver, one of the most interesting creatures in our great outdoors. Interesting little creatures, aren't they? They're found many places around the country and they do cause a big problem, flooding roads and even flooding people's yards and houses. But they're interesting nonetheless and we'll have other visits with beaver families in the future. But now, Let's take out some of that walleye that we caught earlier and fix it in a great recipe. Teresa Swanison has a great walleye recipe. A walleye and cider sounds interesting, and Kathy Beitler, it's hard to wreck walleye. That's true. There is a great fillet just like that. You could broil it or fry it mm. just like that. But we're going to cut it into strips, and it does two things. You can check for bones and cut them out that way, and it's 
doesn't take as long to cook when it's cut into smaller pieces. A lot of people like the flavor of meat that's in smaller pieces. Right, and now you can put that into a casserole dish and then boil your cider, and not apple juice, hmm. and then put uh, onions and green pepper and into green it. Green pepper in cider. In cider, and you don't want to cook that thoroughly. Just soften it up until it starts to lose a little bit of its color. And then you're going to add marjoram and cayenne pepper and a little bit of salt and pepper right to the vegetables. The cayenne pepper will put a little bite into it. It does, and it gives it just a little tin of red, too. And then you're going to pour that over the fish. Now, there the fish is still raw. It mm -hmm. hasn't been cooked or anything. And then you're going to cover your dish, and then you're going to make a great topping for it. After, but you cover the dish and... Cover it and cook it for about 20 minutes in the oven. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to put on a topping. Now, topping you could use just about anything you want to. Cracker crumbs. We're going to use breadcrumbs and Parmesan cheese. Hmm. And then it goes back on the dish and under the broiler for about three minutes. I'll be darned. Well, of course, our taste tester extraordinaire is Bob Garner, and it's going to be interesting to see if he likes this dish. Oh, man, this, this is great. This is great. And also the cider in it. I mean, who has ever heard of just cider and a fish recipe? Just slightly. It's, it's, you know, there's something different there, but, you know, it's not overpowering at all. It, what it does... Identify. I can't really identify it. <laughs> what, it. It's truly a flavor enhancer, and it really makes puts a little zing, a little spicy mm -hmm. zing into this there's walleye. There's a zing in this, all right, after you get about two or three bites. Just a cayenne pepper. It kind of sneaks yeah, that, up on you. But. It does, but it's good. Mm -hmm. yep. You put just enough on this. <laughs> but I like that Parmesan cheese topping. That, the crunchy topping. Yeah. Hey, that's great. You know, you know, Freddie, I said a couple of weeks ago, we had a recipe on the show mm -hmm. that I thought was one of my two or three favorite mm -hmm. fish. That's now moved down to four. Yeah, right. <laughs> this one goes this into two good. or three. Yeah. Excellent recipe. It is. Very good. I know walleye and cider sounds like an October recipe, but try it this summer. Details on how to prepare it are in the new Outdoor Digest magazine, along with show rundowns through the end of April. The recipes for each show, oh, we have venison fajitas and broiled fish on English muffin coming up. Oh, they're great. And if you catch a trophy, the Digest has an entry form for our fishing awards program. It's free to enter, and a copy of the new March-April issue is also free for the asking. It features color on nearly every page, an array of articles on hunting, fishing, and shooting, as well as wildlife arts, sporting knives, and wild game cookery. Well, that's our show for this week, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. We try to bring you a fast-paced show with lots of education and information about fishing, hunting, the shooting sports, and wildlife. We'll be back next week with another show. But in the meantime, if you don't do anything else, do one thing for me. Get outdoors if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week. From the northern shores and woodlands to the west, it's history. From copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fishery. To the farmlands of the southern counties and east to Chesapeake Bay. To get all that waits for sportsmen across the USA. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow, the stillness of the forest is encased in Arctic cold. The wind might whisper through the trees and listen to his say. The beauty of our great outdoors across the USA. Next week on Outdoor Digest, we'll bring you another fast-paced, action-packed show. We're going to do a fishing forecast 1989. Remember the drought last year that really clobbered a lot of the fishing and affected wildlife around the country? Well, we're going to find out what effect it had on the upcoming year's fishing around the country. We're also going to have a recipe for smoked and canned fish. Oh, it's a great one. Our outdoor quiz, outdoor headlines, commentary, and a lot more. So join me and the Outdoor Digest staff right here on public television. <laughs>